All right, guys, it is a hot but beautiful day in the bluegrass, and I've got a good video for you. We're going to kind of give you a little behind-the-scenes look about how we divide up our training time. Basically, what we do is we have formal training sessions and informal training sessions. You know, me, I know you're thinking right now, Stoney, what are you talking about formal training sessions? Uh, all, we, all we see in your videos is a bunch of dogs running around, and that's true, you know. I mean, I'm the first one to admit that my dog training kennel is nothing like a boot camp. Uh, it's really just a giant Montessori for puppies. I shape the environment, and the environment shapes these dogs, and that's the way I like to do it. But even me, with my natural tendency towards uh, libertarian ideology, right? You know, my natural tendency to let everybody just be themselves in their own way, right? Even I understand that dogs need to master certain mental and physical skills. Okay, so follow along as I show you how we do our first session of the day, okay? And uh, where we try to master a basic vocabulary and basic physical skills, right? And then we're gonna go out back and go for a walk, and I'm gonna show you what I think is really the glue that ties my whole program together. Okay, so we have a bunch of different kinds of dogs here and uh, we're just gonna get them out and uh, we're gonna work with them one by one so that you can see how, uh, you know, how our day goes. So let's see who, who will come up here first. <laughs> come here, oh my gosh. Look, it's a cockapoo, oh, and a German short hair pointer. Who should I do first? Let's do this cockapoo first. All right, now this cockapoo here, Right? It came to my kennel uh, at, a, at a year old. And so, you know, it, it, uh, it's a little bit behind. So we're doing remedial training with them. You know, but he's learning, right? So watch as I walk this dog, who's a year old, uh, and, you know, doesn't have very good impulse control, doesn't have very good attention span. Watch how, you know, I work with him through these formal exercises, right? What I'm going to try to be teaching him is, uh, you know, how words uh, are correlated with actions. All right, so we're going to be walking around, and I'm going to say easy right here trying to teach him, hey, don't bump into stuff. When I first started trying to walk this dog on this course, he would just jump in my planters and knock the grass down. I mean, he was crazy, you know? Now we're gonna move over here and we're gonna do a foot placement drill. This is another thing that's very hard for year old dogs because, you know, the, when a dog is older, look at this dog. This dog's 14 weeks old. You see, I just came up, this one-eared Malinois. It just came up and said, hey, Stoney, that's easy. I'm gonna do it. This one-year-old dog, it's really hard, right? So we have to be very patient with this dog. Very nice, good dog, easy. Come off of there, hup. Now, uh, watch this, this is hard, hup, for this particular dog. So I had to be very calm and very patient, hup, hup. Very nice, easy, oh good. Now I'm gonna get excited. Oh, good dog, good dog. So I can practice calming him down. This is what we call emotion matching. Very nice, easy, good. Easy. What I tell them when I want them to really be really careful with where they place their feet. Wait. Just chill there for a second. Good dog. Easy. Hup. Hup. Now, this dog, as far as during our formal training time, this dog takes five units of energy <coughs> to every one unit of energy of this young Malinois to create uh, habits, because I've got, to, this dog's got habits, it's got a way of living, you know, and I've got to convince it that the way it's lived this whole year is not the most productive way to live. Now this Malinois puppy, that's completely different. This little guy here, its owner's been working with it a lot, it comes to my kennel, and right off the bat it says, hey Stoney, even at 14 weeks, I think I can get out there and master some of that formal training. So let's take a look and see how easy he is to work. Oh, come on. Up, up, and you'll notice, look, see how compliant this little dog is? Come on, come on, come on. Very nice. He's doing a great job. Come on, come on, come on. Very nice. Easy. Very nice. Come on, come on. Come on. Oh, and Zoe, it's not your turn. All right, now foot placement drill. Up, up. Very nice. Wait. Very nice. Easy. Now, see how all these other dogs are wanting to get a turn? Now look at this same thing that gave that year-old cockapoo a problem doesn't give this 14-week-old Malinois a problem at all. Wait, right, in all my videos I talk about how important early training is. Easy. Very nice. Now you might be wondering why I don't have any shoes on. <laughs> and uh, yes, I know I'm from Kentucky, but that's not why I don't have any shoes on. Actually, all these dogs 
we're going to try to knock out a whole bunch of kayaking and canoeing before the end of the summer. And so all these dogs are going to be going to the lake and going to the river. And so after we knock out this part of the training regimen, right, our vocabulary work and our basic physical skills work, I take them and I put them in the pool. Up. Very nice. Very nice. So you watch, come over here, go down the slide, easy. Right. Now I'm going to walk over to the pool. Oh, come on, little fella. Right? And uh, look, I'm not going to be too formal about it. You're just going to step in the pool with the dog. Oh, let the dog have a little, oh, a little swim. And uh, sometimes you get lucky. Like, see this dog here, even at a year old, like it uh, is excited about being in here, so it jumps right in. Castle said, okay, dude, I've had enough of that water. And I say, well, no, I think we can do just a little bit more. So I get him in here, walk him around. Come on, you can do it. Come on, let's just get one little, one little trip around the pool. Very nice. Oh, and you, I forgot to do you earlier, didn't I? Get in there. Very nice. Oh, come on, Castle. And you'll see, like, look how confident this dog is, how it's just walking around in here. And you'll see how Castle, Castle's perfect on those movement exercises over there. I put him in the pool, freezes up a little bit. So when you're training your dogs and you're doing your formal work, you're going to make varying amounts of progress, you know. And, uh, you know, you have to kind of keep track of that in your journal so that uh, each day, you can build on it because you're asking the dog to learn at your pace. You know, you're asking the dog to learn the things that you think are important. Very nice. Very nice. Oh, very nice. Come on, Cancel. Come on. One more time all the way across the pool. You can do it. Very nice, okay. And uh, that's good enough. All right, that's a good little session right there. All right, now Zoe has hopped in here. She wants to do some work. Now Zoe, she's about a, maybe a seven month old lab. Came to us from Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, Zoe, like a lot of dogs, you know, she would sit at her house and uh, you know, be in the kitchen or the yard or the garage and she'd do great obedience. But then when, you know, our owners would try to take her out into a high stress or high distraction environment, it would kind of all fall apart. And that's the kind of stuff that bringing your dog to a puppy Montessori deals with, right? We get these dogs out and we let them gradually gain confidence through interaction and through doing things, through being successful. You know, confidence is built on success. Come on, Zoe. Come on, come on. Very nice. All right, so we're going to get Zoe, work on our vocabulary. Come on. Easy. Very nice. Oh, you are smarty. Up. Very nice. Wait. Oh, good dog. Now we're going to get her excited. Come on, come on. Up, 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 up. Oh, you're so good. Up, up, up. You're a fine animal. Good dog. Easy. Very nice. Up. Wait. Oh, that's very nice. Good dog. Easy. That's this little dog here. We're going to reward him for making a good choice. Easy. Oh my gosh. Up. Oh, very good dog. Up. Now, all this stuff, these are these, these words that you hear me saying, these are the kind of words and these are the kind of physical skills that help you navigate the real world. Easy. Very nice. Like you don't need a whole lot in life. Okay? You just need a little bit. <laughs> you know, if you were to really make it as simple as possible, you know, if you, if you, you know, let's say you really just wanted to make communication super simple, you just go out and do a whole bunch of stuff with somebody. As long as you understand how to say, yes, I'd like to see that again, and no, I'd rather not see that again, well, you can build up a great relationship on just on simply on doing stuff and saying yes and no. Oh, very good. Okay, so that's a good repetition for that little girl. Now, let's see who else, who else we can find. We got some German short hair pointers that are running around here chasing butterflies. And, uh, that, you know, here's, now here's something that you have to think about during your formal training. Like, we come out here, and, uh, you know, I'm doing a little bit of food work right now. I'm showing these dogs some attention. Um, you know, I have the uh, kind of the peer effect of, of, of the dog seeing their peers do something, so they kind of want to join in. 
But there are certain kinds of dogs, like see this Malinois, is a herding dog. He's bred to do a job in conjunction with a handler. Uh, so he's very pattern cognizant. This lab's the same way, you know, bred to stay close to you, bred to walk, walk with you and pay attention to you. And you'll notice that you're seeing these German short hairs kind of run in and out of the video field. That's because they're chasing butterflies. I mean, that's really, you, you know, when you watch, if you go through the history of my videos, all these bird dogs that you see, they come out here and they're always hunting something. Come here, Bodie. They're always hunting something. They're hunting, they'll hunt rabbits. Hey, Bodie, come here. They'll hunt rabbits, they'll hunt, uh, oh, they see like Bodie right here? You see, he says, dude, are you telling me that you want me to do something that's going to interfere with my ability to chase butterflies? And I had to say, yeah, dude, I am. You know, and this is the part of formal training that uh, teaches the dog that sometimes there are things that have to be done that that's not the most fun, right? But what's going to happen is we're going to do this formal part of our training drill, then I'm going to let him go back to chasing butterflies. And that's a theme that you're going to see throughout the rest of the video. And if you look closely, you see it through all of my videos. I'm always teaching the dogs how their access to everything that they want hinges upon work hinges upon indirect action. You want to chase butterflies? Okay, be willing to come over here and get your homework done first and then I'll let you go chase butterflies. And if you structure your obedience that way from the time the dog's little, then the dog will start to look at work as a way to ensure access to butterflies or birds or rabbits or playing with kids or whatever it is that they want. Come on little Bodie. Come on, come on. Hup, hup, hup. Oh, come on, you can do it. Now see, look. You see where he's looking? He's looking over there because there's a bunch of butterflies that are over there in my uh, uh, fence line. So I'm going to have to back him up, right? get his attention, maybe come in here and show him a little bit that we're doing some food work. And look, see again, he's not concentrating. You haven't seen that out of the other dogs. When you're doing your formal work, guys, like you have to be involved and you have to, you know, kind of micromanage their activity so that you can shape the way they view interacting with the world. When you're doing your informal work, all you have to do is kind of keep them safe and make sure you put them in environments where the environment is going to do the teaching. So right here, I'm going to have to do this over and over again until Bodie gets it. Oh, watch out. And see, he just, oh, right, look, he's not wanting to work. He's not wanting to work. And that's okay. I understand that. You know, hop, 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 hop. And we'll just keep at it until he gets it. And a lot of people, when they talk about training these bird dogs like this, they call them hard-headed, you know, they call them obstinate. But in reality, guys, it's just a dog that's bred to notice movement and to chase things, to chase birds, you know what I mean? So you can't really get mad at them for being who they are. Come on. Now, once we get moving, come on, up, 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 and I make the activity interesting. Oh, come on, Bodie, you can do it. Uh, then Bodie will probably start to, uh, you know, do a little bit better. Come on, up, 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 up. You have to be very patient with your formal work. Good. You have to judge every dog as an individual and put them on their own pace. Wait. Very nice. Easy. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go around this course a couple of times until Bodie gets it, you know, right. And when I say about right, he doesn't have to do it perfect. He doesn't have to do it as perfectly as Castle. But he has to, he has to do it well enough to meet my standards for improvement over the last time. Watch out, nerd. Easy. Very good. Hup. If I can ever get him into a nice rhythm, he'll do fine. Good dog. You a smarty, Bodie. Hup. Very nice. Hup. Very nice. Hup. Good boy. Easy. Oh, it's a good dog. Easy. Good. Go on. Oh, you can do it, Bodie. Very nice. Hup, 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 hup. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Wait. Good job. Easy. Now, I had a little trouble with this before. I'm going to get him a good line. Hup, 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 hup. Oh, come on. You can do it. Oh, see, now he walked right, right around it. I just got to go back and do it again. And we'll do it and do it and do it until he gets it right. Hup, hup. Very nice. Hup. Very nice. Good boy. Oh, my gosh. Wait. Easy. Good boy. Hup. Oh, good dog. Wait. Easy. Very nice. Hup. Good dog. Watch out, watch out. 
Oh, now see right there at the end where you got a little bit sloppy? I don't like that. That can cause me trouble later on. So I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna do it again, and we're gonna get it right. Good. Watch out, Castle. Good, easy. Very nice. Hup. Very nice. Walk over here. Hup. Oh. Good dog. Now we're going to go over here and we're going to get in the pool. Oh, now I know he's not going to want to get in the pool, so I'm not even going to give him the chance to refuse. I'm just going to pick him up. Oh, and we're going to get in the pool. Oh, there we go. Very nice. And he doesn't have to love it at first. I'll settle for, you know, just being, you know, relatively indifferent, to be honest with you. Good boy. Walk over this way a little bit. Come on, come on. Very nice. I walk the other side of the pool. Oh, and that's good enough. Oh, that's a, what we would consider a successful repetition of our formal work. Oh, all right. Who else do we have Pointer here? puppy. Augie, come here. Oh, very nice. Oh, so Augie's a good little feller. He's a wild character, too. Come on, let's go. Very nice. Go over that way. Hup. Good dog, and wait. Good. Now look at this, guys. <laughs> If you ever wonder why you see all these dog trainers with Malinois, just watch Castle and see how he does all this stuff voluntarily, and there's your answer. <laughs> the dog makes the dog trainer a lot more often than the dog trainer makes the dog, just to be honest with you. Okay. Come on, Augie. You can do it. Okay, so now Augie also has a little bit of trouble with the tire, so we're going to try to be calm and, and help him here. Oh, you'll notice that sometimes I get the dogs really excited and help them, you know, put a lot of effort into doing the tires, and sometimes I'm very calm. When you're doing your formal work, guys, you have to match, like, your expectations to the dog, but you also have to match your approach to teaching the particular lesson to the dog, right? Some of them need you to help them get fired up, and some of them need you to be very calm and quiet and supportive. Easy. Very nice. Oh, come on. And that's the whole point of the formal activity is so that you can tailor all the different elements so that you can tailor all the different elements uh, in your structured environment here to the, to the needs of the individual dog, right? I mean, I'm, you know, you'll see I'm sitting here and I'm rewarding these dogs that are kind of following, following along and, and offering to do work, but I'm, I'm tailoring my actual, you know, body mechanics and movement and vocal inflection to this particular dog. Easy. Good. Well, when we go out and do our informal training, you're going to notice that, uh, you know, I'm not tailoring anything. We're just going out into an environment and, and letting the lessons happen as they happen. Good. Hup. Very nice. Hup. Oh my gosh, you're a smarty. Can you come down the slide? Oh, now see, look here, right here. See that dog started to want to go around there. Some of them, for you know, for who knows why, some of them just don't like going down the slide. See him sitting there? And maybe he'll chase some food down that slide. Maybe he won't, you know. <clears throat> but you might see me use a little food on that slide for some dogs. You might see me slow a dog down or speed a dog up. You might see some of them that like to go up and backwards instead of go down and forwards, you know. And during your formal time, you keep track of that in your journal and you make adjustments for that particular dog in each daily training session. Come on, come on. Some of them really don't like getting in this pool, and some of them love getting in the pool. Oh, if I remember right, oh, this dog is okay with it. Oh, let's see. Yep. Oh, he's pretty cool. He'll get in here and walk around. <laughs> and look at Zoe. She loves it. She says, hey, that's great. Oh, you're a very nice dog. Very fine animal. And you're a very fine animal, Castle. Oh, come here, come here. Oh, just walk around, it's all you have to do. You have to make some progress. Show me some progress, buddy. Good dog. Oh, what are you doing? Do you wanna get back in here? Oh, hello. Oh, well, come on, you can get back in here. There you go, good dog. Good, very nice. Come on, just walk across the pool a couple of times. Oh, you can do it. Very nice.
Oh, very nice. Okay, and that's plenty. Oh, for Augie. Good dog. You can go out. Oh, and you can go out. And then look who's come over here. Sophia's come over here and she says, hey, can I have a turn? And I'm like, well, sure, Sophia. Sure you can have a turn. Good. Up. Very nice. Wait. Now, Sophia's about a year old. She come to us. And again, like Otter, she, like she had a way of doing things. You know what I'm saying? She thought uh, all day was Sophia time. It's Sophia time all the time, right? And uh, when she came out here with that attitude, she wasn't getting much in the way of interaction from people and these other dogs. And over the course of the last uh, couple of weeks, she's learned that she gets more attention by being calm and compliant and attentive and being a willing participant in the activities. It's not that I'm making her be good, it's that I'm giving her the opportunity to be good and I'm providing an incentive structure that makes her think that being good works out to her best advantage. Access through indirect action. Good, very nice. Once these guys, I mean, what you'll do, like with those short hairs, you saw I got a little bit of resistance because you can see over there, Bodie's still running around chasing butterflies. You get a little resistance from the dog sometimes when you're trying to teach them about work because they're like, work? Why would I want to work? I just want to enjoy myself. Dogs are just like children, you know, the idea of working hard now to enjoy yourself more later, it's not immediately evident to, the, to them, you know. And so it's not, when you, when you bring a dog into a, in, uh, work to, into a training environment, it's very important that you understand that and try to remember back when you were a kid, you know, I mean, how good a worker were you when you were a little kid? Probably not that good. Somebody has to teach you about working. Oh my gosh, very nice. Oh, we forgot our table. But just a couple of weeks of structured activity. And Sophia is doing great. And uh, she's not giving me a hard time at all. Very nice. Now watch. When I say she's not do giving me a hard time at all, <laughs> I thought there for a second she was going to not go down that slide. Because that's how the dog business works, right? As soon as you say they're doing well or they're not giving you a hard time, then that's, that's <laughs> everything falls to pieces. Okay, now, again, I'm not going to give Sophia. You saw Zoe. It's a similar age to this dog, a little bit younger, but yeah, Zoe just hops right in there. You won't see Sophia make that same effort, so I'm just going to pick up uh, Sophia and not give her the chance uh, to not do what I want. Okay, and I'm going to get in here and make it happen. There's a lot of stuff in the dog training business during your formal training sessions where you just have to make things happen, and you know, they, they, there's just no getting away from that. Very nice. Dogs have their own agenda. Dogs have their own things that they think are important, you know. It takes a long time to convince a dog that your agenda should be their agenda. They go like, why should I care about what you think is important, Stoney? Why should I care about coming and being still and having good manners? And you would like to just tell them with words, hey, if you'll come and be still and have good manners, then everybody will like you and you'll get to do lots and lots of fun stuff. But you can't tell them with words. You have to treat them like they're from Missouri. You have to show them. And that's what we're doing here with our formal trainings. We're showing them the relationship between working and getting what you want. Because, hey, look, you see me doing some food work right now? Guys, look, this food work's just a few weeks because it doesn't take long at all for the dogs to understand. We walk out of the building, and if they'll knock out that small challenges course, then it's off to do fun stuff. They can play with their buddies. They can chase butterflies. We can go out back and uh, chase a four-wheeler. We can go shoot the dummy launcher, right? That's when you know you've made real progress with a positive reinforcement training strategy when the dog says, oh, okay, let's knock that work out and then get to the fun stuff. If, if you're stuck in a cycle with your positive reinforcement training where like you're using a food, you're using food to try to get your dog to behave well, then listen, you might as well hang it up. You know, if you have an adult dog where you're still having to give them treats, you just, just hang it up. You know what I mean? Because you, you, you're not making any progress. You know, you need to go hire somebody to show you how to wean your dog off the, that food, food rationing program. Good dog. We're walking around here. I mean, if a dog can't understand that getting in the swimming pool and following me around and doing complex activities with me is fun, then I'm doing something wrong with my presentation, you know. So by the time that a dog's adult, an adult, they should really have internalized the concept of, 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 of having good manners or being polite or having good etiquette, however you want to describe it, and getting to do what they want to do. Okay, who else do we have around here? All right, guys, we have Sadie, the newest member of our cast. 
She's a 13 week old white lab. And uh, you know, when you're doing your formal training, make sure that your training parameters match your dog's mental and physical developmental stage. Right, so at, at this stage, 13 weeks old, we're not expecting a lot from Sadie. We're gonna put her on the leash and we're gonna walk backwards and we're gonna kind of give her some treats for uh, following us around. Come on, Sadie, you can do it. Everything's gonna be really easy, right? And I'm just gonna work my way through the small challenges course, you know, making these base associations. Like, you know, just give her a kind of a general idea of what we're gonna be doing when we're out here in the classroom, in the formal classroom. Good dog. You're very smart. Oh, and you see how I'm going backwards? This helps draw the puppies to me. Oh, and I got these other dogs, these mentor dogs here. These guys all have some experience. And so she's kind of following me and she's kind of following along with them, but I don't expect her to be able to do these activities yet. I'm just gonna kind of come over here. Oh, and, and say, look, you know, when we come up to an obstacle, you know, make some attempt to, uh, to, to master that obstacle and, and something good will happen. Come on, come on. And so she goes around it or she comes over here and jumps over it. That's all fine. I just want to try to give her the basic idea that we're going to work together to solve problems. So this obstacle is a problem. It's an impediment in the environment. And I want her to understand that we're going to work together to solve any and all obstacles that we might face as she matures. Good dog. Come on, come on, you can do it. Oh, come on, come on. And I might have to get up here and do it with her. Oh, come on, you can do it. Oh, you're going to go under it? That's okay. Let's see if we can go over it. Oh, oh my gosh. And you see how I got her up there on it? You know, or really, to be honest with you, how I just positioned my body in such a way that she would get up there on that herself. Now I'm going to make sure some good things happen, make a positive association with being up here on this board and following me around. Good dog. Come on, little Sadie. Oh, you're so smart. Now again, watch how I position my body here. You know, learning by doing. I'm going to do this with the puppy. Come on, help. Oh, very nice. And these tires, these are big, tall tires, so I don't expect her to be able to do these tires. You know, I'm just going to get in the tire. Oh my gosh. Kind of give her an idea that this tire, like these other impediments that we run into, it's just something to be conquered. You don't have to conquer it right now. Just like if you were going to become a mountain climber, you wouldn't go climb, uh, you know, Mount Kilimanjaro tomorrow. You go find your little mountain, right? And so that's all we do. We find some little mountains, we walk a little ways up them. And then uh, constantly trying to, you know, find us a little bit bigger mountain. Come here. Oh my gosh, very nice. Very nice. And look at Castle. Castle's literally one week older than Sadie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's quite a bit of difference in the uh, physical and uh, mental maturity level oh, of a 14-week-old Malinois <laughs> and a 13-week-old uh, White Lab. That's funny, isn't it? Come on, you can do it. Oh, you're smarty. Very nice. I tell you another thing that's funny about this little White Lab is uh, you'll notice, well, maybe not on that side so much, but on this side, you can see she's really filthy. And uh, where she lives, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a real nice house and super clean. And <laughs> she's never had a chance to get dirty in her life. And so <laughs> the very first thing she did on the day she got here was to get as dirty as possible. And uh, she looked like she worked in a coal mine. Now look, I'm gonna come up here and do this with, with, uh, oh, with Sadie. And whether she gets this or not, I don't care. I, I really don't care. You know, I'm just going to get over here and show her that I'm willing to go out in life and help her conquer oh, any challenges that she might face. Oh, you're a very good dog. And maybe I can get her to do it. We'll see. You go over there. Oh, look. Very nice. Oh, she says, but I don't want to do two of them in a row. And I'm like, well, what if I get up here and do it with you? Oh my gosh, you're a smarty. And I'll do the same thing right here. Oh, what if Uncle Stoney does it with you? Oh, you'll just run around it? I understand that. I understand that. But is there, is there any possibility that you might want to... Oh, oh, is there any possibility that you might be able to walk up here with me? Oh, let's see. I think you can do it because you're a very talented little girl. You're a very talented little girl. Uh, tell you what's funny is I had a little, 
if you go watch my video about uh, doing a search and rescue training foundation for a, for a Labrador Retriever puppy, I had a little dog here named Holmes. And out of all the dogs I've ever had here, Malinois, Dutch Shepherds, Pit Bulls, Jack Russell Terriers, Patterdale Terriers, the whole bunch. Holmes, I called him the Labrigo. He was as sure-footed as any other dog that I'd ever seen in my life. Very nice. Oh my gosh. See what I mean about making adjustments to your formal training sessions. You know, like I'm always on you about learning by doing and how that's super important. But <clears throat> when you're learning by doing in a formal setting, right, we have to make sure that we're helping the dog be successful. Because if your dog training uh, uh, repetitions aren't successful, then the dog is uh, not going to have any confidence. And uh, if the dog doesn't have any confidence, it's not going to be able to perform at a high level. Performance is not always based, you know, it's not always a direct result of potential. You know, performance a lot of times is simply based on uh, how efficiently the dog can realize its potential. So, like uh, when I'm coaching over at the gym, I always tell people, like, uh, you know, athletic performance is not is not defined by potential, it's defined by realized potential. So that's what you're always after. You might have a little bit less potential than somebody else, but if you realize a higher percentage of your potential, you can still win, right? And that's what I always want to make these dogs understand. Not all of these dogs have the same physical and mental, you know, capabilities. And I'm fixing to get one out here in a second <laughs> to really make that point. But like they can all, all you know, realize as much of their potential as possible if you will just build your training sessions on success. Oh, good dog. Very nice. Oh, now look at this. She just jumped right in here and went right to swimming. That is awesome. Tell you what's funny too is like, you know, sometimes during your formal training, like maybe you have a dog that's got uh, like a great, great leash skills, but poor recall. Maybe a great recall, but uh, poor leash skills, you know. So, so don't, don't worry about that. When you're doing your formal work, just, you know, break everything down into small digestible pieces, right? And then, uh, you know, some of the things are going to just take a little bit longer and they're going to take just a little bit more effort. But, like, you know, you don't know what you're going to get till you do it. That, how did I know that this dog would take right to swimming? I didn't. I just put her in the pool. And uh, so she took right to swimming. So instead of taking me, you know, a week or two weeks to get her ready to go to the lake, she'll be ready to go in two or three days. And then some of these other dogs, be 14, 15 days of work before I can take her to the lake or take them to the lake, you know? It just is what it is. And during your formal work, you just track it all and uh, uh, you just build on your successes every day. Now I'm gonna go get a dog right now and show you, whoo, Lord, what, what patience looks like. All right, guys, now listen. Uh, I'm gonna show you, this is my buddy Cracker Jack. And, uh, <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, about realizing your full potential, right? When, you, when you're working with a dog like Cracker Jack, you really have to think in terms of what his potential is, right? I'm used to getting these kind of, you know, athletic, high-strung, high-drive dogs here at my kennel. And uh, this lady I know sent this dog up here. She got it for her mother, and it was, it's a Borzoi. <laughs> and every dog I have here... Uh, you can throw them up in the bed of the truck. You can get them out and ch let them chase a the four-wheeler. They can climb on the four-wheeler and they can wrestle and play and carry on. And then I get Cracker Jack. <laughs> hey, and Eli, how's Cracker Jack's wrestling ability on a scale of one to a hundred? Two. Two. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to wrestle worse than Cracker Jack if you were a dog is to not be able to wrestle. To like, you know, be like, uh, I don't know, like uh, dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so, you know, he has trouble jumping, he has trouble climbing. We put him in the pool, he tried to drown himself, you know, he's very emo-esque. And, uh, but I'll be honest with you, the dog has grown on me. And uh, I really like Cracker Jack now, and he's very endearing. And he's going to make the lady that he's going to live with a wonderful pet. And I would have never thought, if you would have asked me the first few days he was here, I would have never thought that he would become one of my favorite dogs. But he's not only become one of my favorite, but any one of your favorites, Eli? Oh, absolutely. He literally is just so silly and so sweet and so entertaining and so happy to see you that you just can't help but love him, right? But with these dogs like this, you, you know, even though we love him and even though we accept the fact that he's not the most physically or mentally gifted dog in the world, right, we still have to try to help him realize his full potential. 
Cracker Jack, so let's see what that looks like. He's over there trying to get a frog out of a tire. <laughs> let's see if we can get him to come over here. Hey, Cracker Jack, come here, buddy. Look, and he comes over here pretty happy. So we're going to say, hey, I appreciate that. Give him a little treat. And then we're going to go and we're going to work. And guys, talk about this is slower. <laughs> you know how when you're a little kid and you're waiting for Christmas to come and it seems like it takes forever? Uh, getting this dog to uh, master this small challenges course is like being four years old and waiting for next Christmas. <laughs> it's been really a, it's really been a, 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 just a, an exercise in, 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 in exhibiting Job-like patience, right? So, but he's actually started to do pretty well. So watch him. Good dog, you're a fine animal. Come on, easy. Very nice. And we've got him to where he walks very politely on the leash. He comes when he's called 99% of the time. I might have to call him a couple of times. He does a pretty good job on his proprioception drills. Easy. Come on, come on. Now, there are some things that he can't do, and we would never ask him to do because he's a frail dog, right? Up, up. He can jump that. These tires, they're just off limits for Cracker Jacks. So think about this like standardized testing. We just kind of took this area of the standardized, te standardized test and we just pushed it over to the side. Come on, very nice. And another thing we have to try to be careful of is we have to kind of clear the way when we come up here to walk on our railroad ties so nobody knocks him off. Easy. And look at Castle. Castle's like that smart captain of the football team guy that you have to sit next to that made perfect grades in math. Come on, easy. Oh, you can do it, buddy. Very nice, I'm very proud of you. Come on, come on, up. You can do it. Very good. Up, up. Very nice. You are a smarty. Good boy. Good dog. Go on, Castle. Now see, I can just push Castle off of there. <laughs> Wait, Eli, what would happen if I pushed uh, Cracker Jack off there like that. <laughs> he would literally break some bones. We'd be on our way to the emergency room. Oh, so there's no pushing on. Uh, there's no pushing on Cracker Jack. Oh my gosh, very nice though. He's a very smart fellow. Very sure-footed nowadays. Uh, in a relative sense. Oh, you can do it. Come on, Cracker Jack. Up. Oh my gosh, you're doing it. You're such a good dog. Very good, huh? Oh, we had to be very careful up here, guard him like he's the president of the United States. Make sure nobody gets him, knocks him off the table. All right, nerds, you guys go on down that way. Go on, go on. All right, Cracker Jack, you ready? I'm gonna help him down the slide because I don't, hurt, don't want him to hurt himself. Oh, there's a dog jam. Oh, watch out. Make way for Cracker Jack. Oh, good boy, Cracker Jack. Now, we're gonna bring him over to the pool. Now, I don't know if you guys watched the <laughs> the video where I put him in the pool the first time and he just gave up and decided to <laughs> commit suicide. But he's made some real progress towards, uh, you know, like getting in the pool and moving around and, and being relatively comfortable. And we have made it. The, the whole kennel staff has decided that it's a project to actually take uh, Cracker Jack to the lake and take him kayak and let him go swimming successfully at least one time, even if it means we have to keep him here for free. Come on, Cracker Jack. But the first time we tried to put him in here, uh, he was a little bit shorter at the time too, but he just tucked his legs and kind of rolled over. And look at him now, he's actually moving around uh, and uh, kind of enjoying himself to the point that every day we had to fill the pool up and then we have to let all the water out of the pool because we're afraid that when we're not paying attention that if we leave water in here, Cracker Jack will get in the pool because he tries to, but he won't be able to get out. So we literally <laughs> have to fill the pool and drain the pool every single day just for this one dog. <laughs> Come on, Cracker Jack, keep moving around the side. That's very nice. Come on. Oh, he's doing a good job. Now let's just, here, we'll just drag some of these dogs in here. Good. We'll get everybody in here. Come on, you can do it. Oh my gosh, and what about you? Come on. Oh, we just have a pool party. Oh, what about you? You're a very good dog. Oh, come on, Sophia. Oh, do you need some help, Sophia? Oh, come on, nerd. Good. Oh, what about you, Bodie? Oh, just have a whole pool party here. Oh, to help. Ah, 
to help the dogs that aren't so confident realize, oh, not a big deal about getting in the water. Get in here and hang out with Uncle Stoney. Get a treat every so often. Oh, where do you think you're going, nerd? You don't need to go anywhere. Get in here, put your paws down. Uh, today is Eli's birthday, so we're thinking about getting out to pool floats and drinking some beer since Eli is officially 21 years old. Oh, where are you going, nerd? You don't need to have your feet up there. All right, okay. Well, so look, now, that's enough. I don't want to bore you with every single dog here. I just kind of wanted to show you, you know, what our formal training time looks like, uh, including the adjustments that we have to make to the performance and expectations of each individual dog. Now we're going to head out back and we're going to do some informal training. Oh, all right guys, well we are out and uh, on a walk and we're going to do the important part of dog training now. We have knocked out the formal stuff that we work on every day, you know, all the vocabulary work and the exercise with small challenges and, and you know, that might surprise you uh, that uh, when I'm talking about the important work, I'm talking about the informal learning process, not the formal learning process. I mean, I'm a dog trainer, so you would think that I would try to act like the sit and the down and the heel and all that stuff is the important part, but no, not really. How I look at dog training is that the formal aspects of dog training, you know, getting your dog to where, you know, it understands a basic vocabulary, it's got basic physical skills, that formal part is really only needed to remove the impediments that get in the way of fully integrating your puppy into your life. I think, and you're never going to convince me any differently, but I think the most important part of dog training is simply getting out and learning by okay. doing. And to learn, you know, to, to really fully embrace that concept of learning by doing, guys, you have to be willing to get off the beaten path. Back up there a little bit, Eli. So, like in my backfield, I have a, a series of paths mode, and we come back here, and we bring clients back here, and we walk around and stuff. And, uh, I mean, it's really fun you know, to come out here. A lot of people live in the suburbs, and so they don't get to just walk around like this very much. And I always try to draw their attention to the fact that like when the dogs are walking, even just on grass, just the grass in your yard, right? There's a lot of stuff going on. Look, there's clover. Clover has a specific smell. There's dandelions. Dandelions have a specific smell. There's dead grass and there's live grass, right? So, I mean, there's a lot, even just in a yard. A yard is a lot more, uh, complex than what you would think. But let's get off the beaten path and let's compare the complexity or the overall stimulation level of a yard, okay, to a field full of uh, native plant growth. So look, here's the beaten path and this is what we call our unbeaten path, right? So watch, as soon as I just step over here, I mean, I'm in a completely different universe. This is completely a qualitatively different experience, right, than being in just a yard. Come over here and show them this, Eli. Like, look at this little stauber bush here, right? See all them little sharp things on it? Well, dogs will come over here and they'll run into that and it'll hurt their nose. And then they start to think, okay, well, listen, if I smell this kind of bush, I better be cautious. And they get moving around. And I want you to sometimes, you don't have to do it, but just sometimes go out in your yard and think about how hot it is. Like, it's 88 degrees right now. Okay, and reach down here and feel this ground. Okay, pick you up some of this grass and smell it. <sighs> Go off the beaten path. Look, right here on the edge of the beaten path. Already, look at that little flower there. It smells completely different. Now I'm gonna move over in here. And what's the first thing I run into? Ah, I run into something sharp. Now if I was a dog, I'd run into something sharp, I'd have a bad experience. I would smell that and I would categorize that smell. I'd go, oh, okay, if I smell that, I better be you know, kind of careful. Now I'm gonna be moving around and just get off the beaten path just a little bit and think about being a dog. Think about being a puppy. And I want you to understand how much more stimulation that your brain is receiving as a result of getting down here and getting off the beaten path. You know how I'm always on you talking about, you know, toes to nose stimula stimulation, right? So as this puppy's walking around, you know, it feels certain things on its little paws. Right now, this puppy's from the suburbs of Louisville, right? It doesn't know about this. We might, like I always say, we might as well be in deepest, darkest Africa, right? These dogs are coming out and they're having a good time and they're exploring, okay? And their brain is having to process and categorize all of that information, right? Let's move back over here, right? 
this is the amount of you know and i hope this is coming through on the video but this is the amount of stimula stimulation that the brain's having to process oh wow we've got some grass a few different kinds of grass and weeds some dead grass and a pretty even temperature across all this grass just right off the beaten path wow tons of different kinds of plant material tons of little different kinds of bugs there's all kinds of little rodents that live out here you know there's mice there's uh groundhogs there's rabbits and all of those things when they're on their nightly activity they're doing mechanical damage to the plants they're peeing and pooping and the dogs are smelling that right and then i mean things you don't think about but this is something simple right hold your hand up get out in some uh like a high grassy area like this hold your hand here and see how hot it is like you can see me sweating it's you know probably about 88 89 degrees now the temperature difference between right here and if i stick my hand under this grass and get on this cool dirt this cool dirt here, okay, that right there, that's probably, I don't know, about 70 degrees. It's about the same temperature as the air that comes out of your air conditioner vents, right? And so just think about that. Not only smells and sounds and textural differences, but temperature differences. And so the brain is having to work overtime processing all that information well the brain is like a muscle the more that you use your brain the stronger it gets so when you're you know when you're working with your puppy you want to get them out in the real world and make sure that they get a lot of stimulation because that promotes proper mental growth and uh look i'll show you you know getting off the beaten path not only is just awesome from an environmental experience standpoint okay you can also increase the amount of uh, exercise that you get in a given amount of time remember when you're thinking about exercise sessions like you only have two variables right you have intensity and duration it, it, an exercise session can be really intense and short duration or low intensity and long duration well I could come out here for in, for instance watch I'm gonna throw this dummy and I just throw it on the beaten path and Henry's gonna run down there and uh, get it. And you know, you'll notice that Henry runs in an arc <laughs> and he goes through the brush. That's because these puppies all mob him when he's coming back. So before any of you guys you know, get on me about my dog not retrieving in a straight line, you gotta understand Henry has to come out here with about 20 puppies a day and get mobbed. And so he kind of runs like a running back. <laughs> he, he's trying to get a, you know, he has developed patterns of evasion, right? Okay, but watch, you see him, he just goes down on the beaten path. And there's a certain amount of fun and a certain amount of stimulation involved in going down there and getting that dummy. Let's see, though, what happens when I go out here and uh, get off into the wilderness area, okay, and do the same thing. Now, I'm going to call these puppies with me. Come on, dogs. So fetching when uh, there's no impediments is easy. Fetching in the brush, that's a lot harder. You notice how he's having to hop and jump and hunt, right? Oh, good boy. Very nice. So watch, I can throw this thing. And he's going to have to run over there. And he's going to have to find it. And he's going to have to charge through the brush to get back. And so the intensity of this exercise session, right, is a lot higher, right? And if the intensity is higher, then I can get, uh, you know, a at a very effective exercise session in a short amount of time and so I don't have that excuse oh I didn't have time to exercise my dog all I had to do was get off of the beaten path just a little bit now here's my big Anatolian Shepherd buddy he's out here on Coyote Patrol you know but look we're walking around and Henry is serving as a mentor dog now you'll notice that I have my shotgun on right because what I like to do with these young dogs is I like to make positive associations, right? So, you know, these dogs that come stay with me, a lot of them are going to be house dogs that go hunting. And I draw a very clear line between a hunting dog and a house dog that goes hunting. You know, there are dedicated hunting dogs in the world, but most of us, we've got jobs. And so since we have jobs, uh, we can't have a dedicated hunting dog. So what we have are house dogs that are expected to come and be still and have good manners. And uh, then if we get some time off, we take them hunting, right? And so I want the dogs to understand when we come out and if they see this shotgun, if they see this backpack, we're probably going to go do something fun. And, uh, you know, if you can make a positive association with these items, right, from an early age and you can get them really used to it and desensitized to it, then 
when you go to get in your truck comes dove season, right, they don't just see that and go, oh my God, what's that, what's that, what's that? You know, and get, either get too excited or get a little bit worried or whatever. So whenever you're going on your adventures, you know, if you can, uh, if you have a house dog that goes hunting some, if you can go ahead and put your gear on, right, it'll go a long way towards setting the kind of patterns, those informal patterns that you want to develop, where your dog understands situationally appropriate behavior as it relates to shotguns and ATVs and boats and going hunting and what have you. But I can promise you guys, these dogs, they'll exercise up there in the yard and exercise up there in the yard and they'll play and play and play for, you know, an hour at a time and, and not even get tired. We come out here and we take a nice 30 minute walk through this wilderness, you know, and remember what I always say, guys, it doesn't have to be a wilderness to you. It just has to be a wilderness to your puppy. Dun, dun, dun. All right. Now, what you're starting to notice right now, guys, is that these dogs, they're self-regulating, you know. See how they're kind of calming down and you can kind of see, you can kind of see if you'll look behind me, I'll walk this way, walk that way, Leo, so you can see them coming to me. See their tongues all hanging out? Uh, I, I look at tongues as fatigue meters, you know. When that tongue starts hanging out, then I know that that dog is, uh, you know, starting to get tired. And I let them self-regulate. I let them go lay down. Yeah. There's so much worry nowadays about getting your dog out and exercising them. You know, like, oh, are you going to exercise them too much? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? But no, guys, you're not. You go out, you go for a walk from the time they're puppies. You get them in stimulation-rich environments. And uh, yes, the first few times that you take them, they might overdo it a tad bit, right? So that when you get home, they seem a little bit extra tired. All right, so what? We all do that. You know, when you're a little kid and you go to, to the amusement park, <laughs> you know, how many little kids don't overdo it at the amusement park? How many little kids don't overdo it at the swimming pool, right? But what is the long-term negative externalities of that? What's it, what, who gets hurt? Nobody gets hurt, right? You look over here. Show them, Eli. Come over here, look. This is what dogs do when they get tired. They go lay down. You see what I'm saying? They go lay down, they find them a shady spot. So look guys, you get out and you get to walking and, and, and uh, you know, what you're gonna notice is if you'll get off that beaten path just a little bit, your dogs get fatigued quicker. And uh, you'll notice it because like you'll see their tongues hanging out and you'll see them start to, you know, kind of stop jumping around so much. And everybody here has kind of went and found them a nice shady spot. Well, when that happens, go find you a shady spot. So look, we'll walk over here and, and uh, we'll find us a shady spot too. I'm gonna call the dogs with me. Now you have a couple of options here. Now look at this big old briar bush. You think running into that's any fun? Right? Okay, and I like for dogs to come out here when they're puppies and learn about these briar bushes so they don't learn about it when we're hunting or when we're on vacation, remember that. So I'm gonna walk around it. You'd be surprised how many people I bring out here from the suburbs that walk right in the middle of that briar bush right there. Okay, so like uh, I'm hot and I'm sweaty and I need a break and these dogs need a break. So what are we going to do? <laughs> what is the, the technical answer to being hot and sweaty or your dog being fatigued? <laughs> Go take a little bit of a rest time in the shade. <laughs> you know, these, these lessons... These lessons that, uh, that, that, that people, you know, they act, like, they act like dogs can't figure out what to do when they're hot, you know. And, and, you know, maybe that's true if you have an adult dog that's never had a chance to get out in the real world and do anything fun, okay. I mean, there is a slim possibility that if you have a dog and it's grown up in the suburbs, when you take it out, uh, into a stimulus rich environment okay there's a slim possibility that that dog is going to make himself a little bit what some people would call too tired but ultimately what does too tired even really mean okay you know I mean what does it even mean I'm gonna come over here get my little stool oh sit down here and talk to these dogs for a minute come here babies oh 
Well, what does being too tired even mean, right? Ain't you ever been too tired in your life? Ain't you ever like went to the swimming pool and overdone it or went to the went to the uh, amusement park and overdone it a bit? Oh, I'm kind of tired. I'm going to sit all the way down here. Uh, well, of course. Well, look, when I feel this dog, it's body temperature. It's up. It's hot, you know. But so what? My, look at me. I'm sweating like a pig. It's good for you. It's good for you to get out and get tired. It's good for you to be fatigued. It's good for you to learn, you know, like what the limitations of your body are. Like if I don't get this puppy out and exercise him at a young age, how is he going to know? How is he going to know how to self-regulate? You know, you hear all this nonsense about, oh, you can exercise a puppy for five minutes for every month it's alive. So if it's, you know, four months old, you can exercise it for 20 minutes twice a day. Well, does that make sense to you, right? There's all this nonsense about, oh, well, you want to limit your puppy's activity. You don't want to let them climb and jump on stuff and play rough with other dogs. Well, when are they going to learn how to do that, right? Come here, Butch. Come here, Big Butch. When is Big Butch going to learn how to use his body? I'm going to wait till this dog is two. You know, these dogs, these big uh, Anatolian Shepherds, Kangles, you know, they don't stop growing until they're like two and a half years old. What, I'm going to wait till this dog is, is, is a third of his life is gone before I let him do anything fun, before I start to try to teach him how to use his body? I mean, that's just silly, guys. You want to get out in the real world and let the dogs learn stuff. Come here, little babies. Come here. You can come here. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Now, that's what an Anatolian shepherd sounds like when he sees something or hears something that he doesn't like. That dog is four months old. <laughs> is that crazy? He might be five months old now. But look at this little baby. Oh, this little baby is from Louisville. I mean, you know, and she lives with a couple that's, uh, you know, maybe 60 years old, 65 years old. So when is she going to get a chance to do that if she doesn't come see Uncle Stoney? You know, I want this dog to get a lot of life experiences, you know. And so, like, I understand that maybe this isn't going to pop up in this particular dog's life a lot over the next 10 years. But I want to know that maybe if this dog's three, four, five, and some family comes to visit, even though this dog's owners don't go hiking, even though this dog's owners maybe don't go to the river, right, that the family that comes in can take her hiking. Can take her to the river and she will have had the proper foundation to deal with that kind of activity level and to self-regulate because she had that experience when she was young and so that's all i want you to know that's all i want you to think about i want you to think about the informal aspects of dog training and how important it is and i want you look and i know not everybody likes to get dirty i mean i'm an old dirty dog trainer so like and i'm kind of used to it but guys, if you could just go out just maybe a couple of days in a row and just get down on your dog's level and get off the beaten path just a little bit and smell some things, feel some things. Look at that dirt. Put some dirt on your fingers. Put that dirt up there to your face. You know, get you an old stick and feel the stick. Like see this old stick laid in the shade so it's kind of, it's locust, and so, or not locust, but uh, well, I forget what it is, but anyway, it's, it's kind of a real soft wood, right? And then up at the house, we've got a bunch of oak trees, and so the wood's hard. But see this, see this experience? This is a stick, and it's got mud on it and grass on it. And right now, when that dog is touching that stick with its mouth, when it's smelling that stick, it's not just touching a stick. It's touching a stick and everything else that's been back here. It's, it's, it's touching the stick, and there's little bugs that live in the stick, and probably a coyote's peed on this stick. Who knows? You know, let your dog have some experiences. Picking up a stick, it's not going to kill your dog. Carrying a stick around, it's not going to kill your dog. Could something possibly happen? Sure. But the positive benefits of letting your dog have a, you know, a large degree of freedom in terms of its experiences, it's worth whatever risk that you have to take as long as you, you know, like keep the risk within reason. So let your dog self-regulate. Don't force them to do more than what they uh, would like to do. And uh, get out and enjoy yourself and don't be afraid to get a little bit dirty yourself. Get down here on your dog's level and I promise you it will change your mind about what's really important in dog training. All right, good luck guys.